Um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Simon Winlow to the Liverpool Hope Distinguished Lecture Series today. Um, Simon recently joined Northumbria University in January 2018 as Professor of Criminology, having previously worked at Buckingham Chilterns University, York and most recently Teesside. Um, and at Teesside he established the Centre for Realist Criminology with Professor Steve Hall, who he still give up his time, you could all be off doing far more exciting things. I hope that I can come up with a few points that you find interesting enough to justify your journey to this lecture theatre. Uh, Ian was saying about, about my list of interests, I think one of the things that I'd like to start off by uh, just talking about very briefly is uh, a lot of, you know, I t I've looked at crime, I've looked at violence, all kinds of things, but a lot of it is rooted in my interest to what happened to the working class, the British working class, after the collapse of the industrial labour. The fragmentation of uh, traditional culture, the economic uh, foundation of everyday life has changed enormously in a very short period of time. And uh, in many cases, a lot of the, especially the, the, the harms and the problems that I look at are really the detritus of a decaying system. The economic, uh, the, the transformation of capitalism into a, a profoundly unjust stage. And so we find ourselves in uh, really quite difficult, challenging times. Global financial crisis of 2008 changed everything. Up until that point, it was perfectly reasonable for the key ideologues of uh, global neoliberalism to stress the benefits of the market system, to say that lifestyles are rising, consumerism is being democratised into growing numbers of growing populations around the world, even the poorest parts of the world are improving gradually. Post 2008, all of that confidence, the strutting self-confidence of neoliberals fell away. We were once again returned to history. There was a chance that we could do something else, we could push society in a different direction. The old idea of Fukuyama's idea of the end of history suddenly came to a shuddering halt. But post-2008, the global financial crisis, what we see is not something in opposition to global capitalism, not something that is fundamentally different to ne neoliberalism. What we see is neoliberalism itself come to define the resulting 10 years that we've experienced. And the dominant response of this crucial historical change challenged the global economy was austerity. Austerity is economically illiterate, as most economists would recognise. Governments spend money into the economy. They pay people money, that allows them to pay tax back into the system. States need to spend money in order for economies to grow. This has been a foundation of economics since Keynes. Austerity is an ideological project. It makes no sense economically at all. It makes sense when you consider the broader ideological ramifications of austerity. But the obvious fact, which I'm sure we all know, is things got a lot harder for more and more people. Austerity was a policy that was pursued across Europe. Lifestyles went down quite sharply. We saw all kinds of social problems that are connected to austerity creep up. In Greece, for instance, where uh, the left-wing Syriza good, uh, uh, government have actually enacted really regressive, nasty policies. We've seen the return of uh, kind of all kinds of illnesses that were previously considered to be dead and gone. We've seen a huge growth in suicide, especially after the crisis. We've seen the fragmentation of what remains of their healthcare system. We see all kinds of social problems bubbling up, returning, as a result of the withdrawal of government investment in their own nations. It's not just about the poor or the working class, however. Declining lifestyles affect a much broader population. Consumer credit is absolutely integral to the way that uh, uh, neoliberal capitalism works today. What we see is, especially in Europe, a system of competitive disinflation. Wages have stagnated, or in some cases declined. 
consumer prices, therefore, just to keep our economies ticking over, need to be forcibly held down. People feel as though they can buy, they can get credit, they can continue to buy be beyond need. And this has fueled, of course, a massive growth in consumer debt. And this was a problem that was absolutely crucial to the development of the 2008 economic crisis. But it's also a problem right now. In unsecured personal debt in this country is off the scale. Trillions of pounds. All of this, we'll think about, you know, in a couple of years when the economy crashes again. Usually, capitalists, capitalist markets make it have a significant downturn every 10, 9, 10 years or so. We're right on the brink of that now. And it couldn't come along at a more interesting time. The gap between rich and poor, of course, has grown enormously. We're now at levels roughly equivalent to the horrific years of restructuring that followed the birth of capitalism, industrialism, which completely re reconfigured our social order. People get a sense of their place within a the system. They can, their signs of opulence, consumer opulence, and indulgence around us all the time. But yet more and more people are barely keeping their nostrils above the waterline. They're just clinging on. This is the reality of how our economies work this, they, these days. Many leftists, of course, would say this is a sign of something going wrong. It's not a sign of something going wrong. This is how the system works. We also have the huge mega problems increasingly coming onto the horizon. Global warming is, of course, a huge issue. It will affect all of our lives. It's already around us. It's just that it's happening at such a slow rate that we don't really see the shock of it. Life is already becoming unlivable around the equator. Wars are being fought for access to water. People are killing each other for access to wells. This is part, this fuels a migration away from the southern, the, the, around the equator, to what looks like the uh, epicenter of civility and indulgent consumerism in Europe, in the global north. We also see the rumbling on of global uh, contestation and wars in Syria and wherever else, which is also driving people away from those places. The migration crisis, of course, is real. And we need to be incredibly concerned with huge numbers of people making a very difficult transit from the north coast of Africa and from the Middle East over the Med, across the Med into mainland Europe. Huge numbers of people have died. This is a huge humanitarian concern. But yet still, many millions are making it over into Europe. And the arrival of these migrants, immigrants, has fueled the rise of ethnocentric nationalism. For years we thought fascism was dead and gone. After 1945, uh, that kind of nationalism was verboten. We didn't discuss it in mainstream politics at all. In East and West Germany, they had you know, really quite incisive kind of anti uh, denatification processes. Uh, you know, it was impossible that these things would ever return. We had the image of Auschwitz. How on earth could we ever go back to that? But very few people who believe that now, that believe that, uh, still have confidence in that position. It's very difficult to predict what lies in the future for us. What this leads to is a huge number of people gradually coming to the realization that things are trending downwards. And this is an important historical juncture. For generations, the European Enlightenment uh, tradition, we believed that we were incrementally moving towards freedom, that using logic and skepticism and rationality, we would build a better society. And gradually, all the mysticism and prejudices of the old order would be identified and dragged down into the sun and they would, where they would wither and die. No one believes that anymore. That traditional incremental advance model that is integral to liberalism simply has no purchase in a world in which growing numbers of people see the world falling apart at the seams. Post-1945, 
working class families in a, an environment in which we had a comprehensive welfare system, a, a bipartisan commitment to full employment, working class parents could look to the future where their kids would do better, where the horrors of the 1930s would be forgotten and we would never go back, but you would do better, kids. You'd go to university, and of course many people experienced that. I was certainly part of that whole thing there where it was hugely important because it suggested progress, not just for me, but for all of us. You go to university, son. You can do it. Now look at the problems faced by students around the country, saddled with debt, moving into insecure labour markets. They actually went to university to avoid. The idea that things will progress and improve is now being revealed as being an absurd preoccupation of essentially middle-class liberals who, for them, the world looks reasonably sunny. The reality out there in the provinces, out there in the real world, is far more challenging. The popular mood these days is incredibly destructive, I think. We've seen the rise of new culture wars. The, uh, the alt-right have an increasing uh, presence, especially in, uh, on social media. They're advocating a lot of, using a lot of the tactics of the old uh, countercultural left to challenge conventions, to float ideas that were previously seen as uh, beyond the pale. We have an increasingly woke liberal left countering these groups and the system itself is incredibly febrile it's uh, you know uh, lots of contest contestation on the cult in the cultural sphere and of course throughout history capitalism has very cogently moved economic antagonisms onto the cultural sphere this is how people like donald trump get er 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 elected how the, uh, the Tea Party have made such inroads into staunchly working class areas. The Republican Party in the States, for example, their economic policies actively hurt the working class, but they can position themselves as being the defenders of the cultural interests of the traditional working class. The old demarcations around class and political alignment are breaking apart. A lot of the kind of cultural uh, enmity that has opened up uh, is also about issues to do with class. And again, there are issues here about deep transformation. Increasingly, it is an essentially middle class liberal left uh, taking the fight to essentially a working class right wing. This is uh, the focus of my presentation here today. But before we go any further, it's absolutely essential that we acknowledge just how pissed off ordinary people are. There are lots of angry people out there. They see their lifestyles declining. They see a, a, a comp the vacuity of mainstream political debate. No one with any abs answer answers. Everyone arguing about the pointless issues to do with a fraction of inflation here versus, a, you know, something else over there. Lots of people are angry and they're looking for someone to blame. And this is the start of my critique of contemporary left. The, con the old traditional left used to harness that sense of anger, those frustrations. It used to take ordinary people who suffered greatly in a capitalist economy built around exploitation and direct them to the locus of power which has always been in the financial economy. You suffer for the very same reason that your neighbour suffers. He suffers, she suffers, you all suffer because of this thing. Traditional leftist politics always banked that enmity. It absorbed personal frustrations into a project that threatened to burst into history and change things. The left today does not provide that function. Increasingly what we're seeing, especially in the north, 
they deindustrialised north, especially areas of South Wales, heavily deindustrialised areas of the Midlands, bits of Yorkshire. Very pissed off people are increasingly heeding the narrative of the traditional nationalist right wing. They're identifying a, pro pro a proximal enemy in an immigrant working class because the left, the traditional left, is simply not there to lead them to an encounter with the realities of capitalism. Of course, you will know that the Bradford is a good place. I've done some research in Bradford. Fault lines running through estates, through uh, parts of the city. Huge distinctions between working class Asians, Muslims, and the white working class. Now, you'll be able to recognise that in the economic realm, there's no distinction at all, right? They're both sets are uh, di experiencing diminishing lifestyles. Both sets are exploited, only able to access the most uh, kind of hollow, banal, uh, soul-destroying forms of employment, hourly paid in some crap factory or call centre doing God knows what. Jobs that you cannot take any pleasure from. No sense of contribution, of building something, of doing something productive. So all the kind of enmities that are opening up in the cultural sphere and fueling forms of uh, increasingly hostile demonization of other identity groups, rather than moving things forward in a productive way to look at the broader context, <coughs> which is about neoliberal capitalism. So a lot of this enmity uh, has fueled the rise of the far right. Germany is the most productive economy in Europe by some considerable margin. It has a surplus economy. The surplus economy in the European system means that other states must run a deficit. The southern states of Europe, of course, are in a terrible economic crisis, a prolonged economic crisis, and because they're signed up to the euro, they can't inflate away from their debts in the traditional way. They can't devalue their currency because it's a currency of the broader European Union. And so they're stuck taking handouts from the central bank in order to uh, try and manage their huge cacophony of social problems. We've seen the EFD alternatives for, alternative for, Ger for Germany surge in the polls. This is the heart of the European project, built around integration, acceptance, toleration, liberalism. Now we're seeing the rise of really quite regressive uh, uh, nationalisms burst forward at the core of Europe. Europe. A lot of the support that has uh, moved to the EFD has come from the Social Democrats, who in recent elections got their worst results since 1945. The Social Democrats in Germany were understood to be signed up fully, uh, uh, you know, membership card and everything, advocates of neoliberal capitalism, of the ruling order. Not antagonistic, antagonistic leftists who want to hold the system to account, but actually the architects of economic policies that were immiserating huge numbers of people. And of course, support for the AFD is at its strongest in those regions of Germany that struggle most economically, most, mostly in the east of Germany. Marine Le Pen came very close to winning a presidential election in 2017. The NF, for goodness sake, have already made huge inroads into the French electoral democracy. In uh, the Netherlands, uh, an openly Islamophobic Gert Wilders is now leading the second largest party in the country. Of course, the Dutch electoral system means that all the other parties can kind of lock the PVV out, but it's quite significant that they've made that much ground from a really marginal, small party right to the core. Hungary, Orban wins his third election in 2017. The Freedom Party in Austria have now have uh, a role in government, they have, I can't remember the uh, ministries they have, but they've taken control of, I think, two or three ministries of government. This is not a slight 
swing that might you know go in the opposite direction in a few years time what we're seeing here is a fundamental shift in the broad politics of a growing proportion of the European working class this is an is issue of profound historical importance that re requires incredible critical thought and in immediate political action it's a fight we can't afford to lose and the fundamental question for me is this as we move further away from the economic crisis of 2008 and encroach upon uh, the next one who is going to represent the interests of the working class who is going to secure the political su support of the working class it's an issue that the left must turn to now very seriously why has the political right been the principal beneficiary of an economic crisis which is just a crisis in the capitalist system why hasn't the political left made any progress post 2008 the uh, lots of key labor politicians in this country engaged in the standard practice of criticizing offering a moral critique of a venal banking elite the Pope and the Conservative Party offered pretty much the same critique they offered a cultural critique a personal critique a moral critique when what was needed was a structural systemic critique this isn't a, cap a crisis of greedy bank caused by greedy banker bankers it's an, it's a crisis caused by the way capitalism works today and we are all about to be affected unless we address these problems at a structural and systemic level <clears throat> we've seen the rise of Jeremy Corbyn uh, for, for years uh, a, a marginal figure in the Labour Party suddenly comes right back onto the scene and that gives a lot of my colleagues on the political left real hope that we can make changes I've, I joined the Labour Party so I could vote for Corbyn he seemed like a decent guy to me he had some good economic policies especially at the last election but the Labour Party is also besieged by well it's interesting to look at who voted for Corbyn who joined the Labour Party to vote for Corbyn and it is people like me ABC voters generally speaking have moved into the core of the Labour Party very difficult to see any presence for the traditional working class at the, in the front bench of the Labour Party this, at the moment it's difficult to deny that we the Labour Party has drifted away from its foundations in the working class under new new labor of course there was an almost uh, kind of overt obvious de uh, desire to kind of move away from the grubby realities of working class life during the deindustrializing years of the 80s and 90s in order to appeal to swing voters in the middle class and that's logical enough to win elections you have to appeal to a broader audience as possible but all of these moves these policy initiatives that were trying to appeal to an almost Thatcherite floating voters in the middle class uh, took the Labour Party further away from its core in the working class we've also seen the uh, disappearance of a lot of the traditional structures of the political left from working class neighborhoods uh, when I was a lad the working men's club had a kind of an education room they had the works of Marx on the on the on the shelf and all that kind of stuff there were workers education committees there were a lot of outreach work from political radicals in the Labour Party to try and educate the industrial working class about the reality of their experience all of that stuff has disappeared Baudrillard uh, coined a phrase uh, which I think is particularly apt that with the decline of industrialism we see a fragmentation we can't reinsert the factory walls the factory traditional forms of working class labor 
bonded the people together in an experience. It forced closeness. People got to know. They lived parallel lives with the people they worked around. They left school at around the same time. They lived in the same neighborhood. They worked in the same factory. They were bonded together at a deep and emotional level. That's less and less the case in contemporary forms of employment. In call centers where I've done a lot of research, people actually, they're in booths. You know, they're not allowed to talk, they've got headsets in. It's a fragmentation of what was once a fairly cohesive working class work experience. And lots of contemporary leftists, especially academics, say, well, we've got all the social media is opening things up and we can communicate online. I really don't think that is any compensation for the decline of those traditional institutions which politicised the working class on a huge level. We have to think critically about why it is that the EDL and Britain First and, uh, 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 are at their strongest in formerly socialist deindustrialised zones of the north. Why is it that these places that actually gave birth to democratic socialism, that were at the very heart of the uh, trade union movement, why are they now going on ADL marches? Why are they now voting UKIP? Lots of the seats that the Labour Party must win to win a majority at the next general election, 70% uh, Brexit to leave. This is a huge issue. The composition, the, uh, the class composition of the Labour Party is changing before our eyes and the implications of those changes are hugely important. The response of the academic left and the political left to the rise of ethnocentric nationalism across Europe has been, I think, absolutely woeful. There's lots of talk about uh, nas nasty fascists who obsess about empire. Uh, I've done a huge amount of research. Uh, myself and my colleagues have done a, a lot of research across the country with people who are you know, returning to politics, but on the far right rather than the left. And they couldn't care less about empire. No one talks about empire. They're not bothered about recreating empire, for Christ's sake. It's just an issue for the academic left who project on a, a far more depoliticized reality their, their, their interpretation of how, how motivation works in these places. The working classes who are voting for UKIP, who are going on Britain first marches, they don't care about empire. They don't care about the past. They're bothered about the present and the future. I listen to a, a lot of working class men, working class women, talk about their anxieties for the future, their kids. Talk about talk to builders, for instance. They talk about competition. You talk about Eastern Europeans coming here that are lowering wage levels. Everything is getting harder and faster and more competitive. And how on earth are my kids going to cope? just to reproduce themselves? How are they ever going to afford a house? Where in the world are, is the home, the place for my kids? There's also a return, really a dumb return to conspiracy theory. Lots of liberal sociologists who during the 1980s just got rid of the kind of old uh, hypodermic model, you know, that the, the Daily Mail has, all immigrants are scum on the, on the, on the front page and then the readers say oh right immigrants are scum and they kind of adopt that that idea and uh, take it as their own that was jettisoned from social science as too reductive too simplistic but now we see the return of that very kind of that very kind of explanation why did so many people vote brexit because of a bus it said so on that yeah you know they read that sign and that they voted for brexit because of this it's dumb and it's simplistic and what we need now, more than ever, is nuanced analysis of social reality. The hypodermic model tells us nothing that we need to know about reattaching ourselves to the decaying remnants of traditional pro proletarian culture. To denounce people who brought, voted for Brexit to be kind of regressive Neanderthals, 
is a gross simplification. Simply demonising and labelling our political opponents, daubing them with the symbols of absolute evil, is the most stupid wrong move we've ever made. What we need to do is recruit these people to the cause of socialism. The left needs to take on the traditional role of saying the reason why your lifestyle is declining, the reason why you can't look after your kids, how your kids can't get jobs, isn't because of the Asians have crossed the road, it's because of this thing, this systemic thing that immiserates everyone in this neighbourhood. What we see at EDL demonstrations, at Britain First marches, is an inverted mirror image of our own political failure. And I have stood on those marches, and these people are angry about the disintegration of their neighbourhood. It is turning to shit the infrastructure around them. Everything is decaying. They can't get jobs. They're justifiably angry. If you were in their position, you'd be angry too. Identifying Muslims as the cause is, of course, unforgivable. But understandable if we are social scientists and we want to get to the heart of the matter. Those people at an ADL march could have been marching under the red flag of socialism. They could have been committed to enforcing a new economic model that includes everybody, irrespective of their religion or skin colour or anything else. An economic model, model that values every single person. We can build it. It's not utopian to believe that we can build an economic model, create something in the future where everybody is involved, where no one is left out. It's utopian to believe that the current economic model will actually survive into the future and uh, allow us to avoid the catastrophes that wait, await us just a little further on the road. I was going to uh, complain about Tony Blair, that's always the thing I tend to do at these times. Uh, a lot of the antagonism in working class communities towards the Labour Party is rooted in the very obvious fact that the Labour Party is now seen as a, a party of government that enacted policies that made everybody like them poor. You go to a mining village, for instance, ask them how they feel about Tony Blair. I'm from Sunderland, go and ask them, you know, the sh shipyards shut, the town never recovered. Still living in a, a past, a kind of deactive culture where things, you know, people are still kind of almost believing that they're going to move into manufacturing jobs that no longer exist. Anyone with any kind of uh, impetus to live a consumer life is increasingly told, get out of here, son, this is a dead place, leave. That's a neat story that's been re reproduced across the country. Lots of working class voters see the Labour Party as inherently middle class and liberal. Their concerns, working class voters tend to believe, are mostly cultural concerns. They don't care. The Labour Party front bench doesn't care about me and people like me and my neighbourhood. They're more concerned with making sure the immigrants have a, a house and whatever else. And again, those ideas are simplistic and wrong, but they exist because we haven't challenged them and instructed people about the realities. There is a huge amount of enmity directed at metropolitan elites. And that's a lot of us here, as being divorced from reality, that we don't see the world that they see. We don't experience the troubles that they experience. And a lot of that is absolutely true, especially if you, you get a sense of it, if you read some of the uh, standard leftist accounts of uh, Islamophobia and the, uh, the, you know, the, the rise of ethnocentric nationalism. The leftist accounts which talk about the return of fascism, it's about whiteness, pathological whiteness. Gaminda Bambra called it uh, a kind of methodological whiteness, the assumption that you know, white people should always be socially included. Gaminda Bambra, I don't want to single her out, but I will do just for expediency's sake. She identifies as a socialist. She said, lots of white people voted for UKIP and voted for uh, Brexit because they feel themselves falling through the economic system 
and they want their uh, privileges reasserted. And this is a socialist account, which is always fragmented. It's about ethnicity. It's about gender a lot of the time. Rather than a traditional socialist account, which is not about difference, but about sameness. That everybody is involved in this project. No one's left out. Those traditional ideas have fallen out of favour, especially in the liberal left academy, but also in the pol political left. <coughs> Deaptation is a phrase uh, coined by Adrian Johnson, the uh, famous philosopher who co uh, created transcendental materialism, which I won't bore you about today since we're talking about politics. <coughs> but deaptation is you know, it's almost the opposite of adaptation. What we're experiencing at this point <coughs> of in our history is not an adaptive move into the future, which integrates everybody in a rolling process of revolution into the future. We're seeing growing numbers of people cut adrift from the process of capitalist hegemony. Growing numbers of people who are falling apart, who see themselves as outside of the system. I can't tell you the number of times I've interviewed people who voted for Brexit or, you know, they're attached to the EDL or something like that. And they say, I, you know, I don't understand the world anymore. What's Facebook? What's this, you know, what's, you know, what's these game shows on TV and all these chin, chinless wonders, you know, with the cookery shows and all this. What world are these people living in? <laughs> all these ads for foreign holidays, Jesus Christ. They feel set apart from the world. They're not connected. They feel, see no utility in democracy. Most never vote. The liberal assumption that if we could just get more people to vote, we wouldn't have Brexit is entirely wrong. The more people you get, uh, you know, usually at the margins, those people are far more likely uh, to, to endorse the kind of politics of the, of the nationalist right. What you get when you talk to these people who voted for Brexit and whatever else is a story of disintegrating traditional working class life worlds. That it was once stable. We had a, a culture that worked. Sure, there were problems, but it worked for the majority of people. All that is dead and gone. Lots of people... <coughs> You know, you walk around their neighbourhoods, they don't recognise the place anymore. Everything has changed. It used to be composed of families, uh, broad networks of friends and families, and now all of that seems to be dead and gone. And this have, has a, you know, a, an aspect which reinforces the traditional right-wing narrative because you've got immigrants coming in who are changing things, bringing c new cultural norms, and lots of people feel set apart from the world. What's going on here? I don't understand it. It's not for me. Across Europe, this idea of a vault, you know, the traditional culture, is a, once again being reasserted on the political stage. That we need to defend traditional culture. We need to reassert those key preoccupations of our long begotten life world. But all traditional cultures will eventually be dissolved in the icy waters of egotistical calculation. Everything you believe is unique and uh, you know, a, a pure culture uh, will eventually break apart and be subsumed by capitalist universalism. Everything can be marketized. From you know, Irish pubs, theme bars, Baudrillardian aspect, Everything is reproduced. Everything can be sold. Even you think you've got uh, you know, a unique culture in Africa or South America or something like that, it's untouched <coughs> by the market. In a year or two, there's going to be some kind of package holiday. You can go and see them do a ceremonial dance or something like that. All traditional cultures are moving in this direction to be subsumed by capitalist universalism. What can we do then? <coughs> Freud made a distinction between mourning and mel melancholia. Imagine uh, the death of a loved one. 
psychological health, if you're in psychologically good health, you mourn the death of a loved one. Your lost object is gone. You learn to live with it. You miss the person, that individual. You might have many kind of vivid memories of the, your life together, but you accept that they're gone and you can move on with the rest of your life. Always remember, but move forward. The melancholic was never able to let go of their lost love object. They were always uh, preoccupied with the absence, the gap that used to be filled by the figure of their loved one. This clouded the rest of their life in a kind of a fog of misery. They're in, unable to escape from it. This is something like the white working class's position today. Desiring of traditional culture, <coughs> there's no way to bring it back. It can't be reasserted. It can't be, you can't dig back in the 1950s and kind of resurrect that thing there. It's impossible. The thing the work, white working class need to do is to engage in a process of mourning. To accept that the, that world is dead and gone and to move forward. And to accept the reality of capitalist universalism. This is the fundamental problem now. Not something that happened way back then, but the problems that are happening now. And if you accept that, and you're intelligent enough, and you have a vanguard to support you that can assist you in trying to explain the reality of the world we face, then you can begin to forge connections with other ethnic groups and other religious groups who experience the exact same problems as you do. This is what we need to address increasingly hostile ethnic tensions in the field of culture. Not tolerating difference, but identifying and accentuating sameness. Tolerance was always uh, a, a really simplistic, shallow notion. Tolerating difference. The thing to do is create a neighbour out of the other. Draw them closer. This is how you get rid of racism. Not by, you know, I tolerate your difference and you tolerate my difference. That edgy tension on the field of culture which is managed by a neoliberal state. But the creation of sameness where your differences don't matter anymore because we have these things in common. The stereotype was always, I don't know, the, the NHS canteen or something in the 1960s. We didn't have the labour, we brought lots of people over from Empire. And then lots of times there'd be work, uh, white workers there who had never seen a black face, never seen an Asian face, and it's the shock of the other. But in time, the ethnic differences cease to matter because you recognise that the person might have a different skill, skin colour, but they love their kids. They've got the same boss, they've got the same problems getting their holidays. They've got the same problems. They live in the same neighbourhoods for the same reasons, the same everyday concerns. For years now, the left has attempted to hold difference on a pedestal. We much respect difference. The thing to do is place difference in the background and move forward with a narrative of shared interests. This is what the left has traditionally done. This is what it must do now. So, in the academic field, what I think we need to do is engage in a thorough intellectual stock check. We must be honest enough to acknowledge the mistakes that we've made. And we've made some big ones. We've been getting our arse kicked for 40 years. It'd be nice to win one, I think. It's not an issue of feeling better. I'm sick of feeling better. We need to win one. Given the historical urgency, now uh, we can't afford to make any mistakes. We need a change of direction and we need it very quickly. The basic way that we can connect to the working class again, to make the left a project of the working class, is to give them a new economic system so that they can see their own personal benefits in this yet to be created system. We need a new political economy and it's not tax and spend. I think the new political economy that we must adopt is best articulated in uh, modern monetary theory, which I won't bore you about too much, but enough is to say that 
You know the uh, household anal analogy that conservative and labor politicians roll out all the time? That we need, our, as, a, as, a, as a nation, we need to pay down our debts so we don't have to pay interest on them. And it's just like a household. If your debts are big, you've got to pay those da debts down or you're just servicing the debts with interest. Best to balance the books and then you can begin to spend. All that is bullshit. The national economies are nothing like a household economy. We have the Bank of England. We produce our own currency. The British nation can buy anything that's for sale in British pounds because it's the sole producer of British pounds. It is absurd to suggest otherwise. Where do you think they come from, these pounds? We produce them. We spend money as a nation into existence. The pound is a nominal fiat currency. It's spent into existence. We lend it out. Banks lend it out. They're a mortgage. We buy things with it. And the circulation of the currency begins. We take money out of the system through taxation in order to manage inflation principally. So when they say, you know, we need to, uh, you know, the huge burden of kind of, uh, you know, historical debt that we're dragging around with us, that doesn't matter. And when you understand how economies work and how money is created and, and used by the system, you understand that the national debt is a figment of our imagination. <coughs> we can afford to buy anything in British pounds, and that includes all unused labour. One of the core policy suggestions of the MMT movement is the creation of a job guarantee. And this is one way that we can connect to a disenfranchised, politically neutral, drifting to the right working class. Job guarantee, we will, uh, if you want to work, we will give you a job. Think of how liberating that would be. Think of the sociological consequences of a full employment economy, not at base subsistence, but at a, a, a full employment economy that paid enough to live a good life. 25 grand job guarantee is, is the suggestion for the British economy. Of course, that's not to suggest that the private industry has to disappear. What it does have to do is raise its pay rates if it wants to attract any workers. Think of what we could accomplish if we ab adopted this as a policy. Think of all the so social problems now that could be addressed through labour. Think of our disintegrating uh, infrastructure. Think of the things that we could build, the, things, the, the policies that we could push forward that would have a, an integrative function, <coughs> that would bond us together as a society, give us a sense of purpose, that we move into the future forcefully. The Green New, De New Deal is often tied to this jobs guarantee programme. Given the ecological problems we face, we should put people to work in a Green New Deal programme. We can build things. We can do things now. We have a, a huge amount of unused labour. The problems that we face can be addressed if we create a new politics. Instead of this regressive talk about balancing the budgets and how are you going to pay for it. How are you going to pay for it? We always get, you know, Andrew Moore pitches that to every politician who has a policy suggestion. How are you going to pay for it? The same way we bailed out the banks. We'll print the money. It's our money. It's ours. All of ours. We can do whatever we want with it. We just have to have the political will to make the choices. And if we can't, if the political left can't represent the interests of the working class you can be absolutely sure that the right will continue to make ground. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Simon. Um, I suspect there will hopefully be a few questions in the audience and Michael Lavalette has kindly agreed to take up his usual role of running around the room uh, like a headless chicken with a microphone. <laughs> So, when he's ready, is this, is this your monthly exercise? So, um, does anybody have any questions? Somebody's got to have something. So, start. 
Uh, thank you for that talk. Uh, I'm a bit curious about your multicultural uh, working class theory, especially when looking at nationalism from the right perspective. When there's a growing uh, group of nationalistic left, is what I'm at least what I'm witnessing. And I'm wondering what your opinion is on maybe the left focusing more on the economic issues and moving away from this nationalistic approach as a way of tackling this rise to the right. Because I find that the nationalistic left are the ones leaning towards UKIP because they've been brought up in anti-Tory households and they refuse to go that way. But the Conservatives would be considered a more centric party in comparison to these far right wing um, growing groups. Yeah, well, um, the nationalist left is, uh, I think, incredibly interesting. And before we get into a kind of discussion of leftist internationalism, I think what we have to recognise is that historically the nation state has been the principal defender of marginalised communities across the world. The nation state uh, is the principal defence against the predations of the market. It's obvious. Now, lots of people are saying that we need to move into a, a, an era of uh, open borders and whatever else. Uh, I'm a, a lexiteer. I don't believe that that's true at all. I think what we've seen uh, with immigration is a move from people uh, of people from incredibly impoverished uh, countries, especially Poland, the Eastern Europe, and whatever else, to the more affluent ones. I don't see that as a progressive issue at all. I think if the EU was truly progressive, it would ensure a living wage for everyone in all the nation states, rather than trying to facilitate the movement of poor people from this country to that one and calling it a good thing. It's also undeniable that in certain sectors, uh, the growth of it, growing numbers of immigrants have placed downward pressure on wages. Simple facts uh, about uh, you know, it, it's how markets work. It's not to suggest that they haven't made a broader contribution in other sectors. But sometimes, especially for the working class in areas that are dominated by really shit jobs, there is increased competition for shit jobs. It's the reality of this situation. I don't think uh, a move towards a kind of, you know, critiquing the nation state. What we need now is a powerful nation state willing to intervene in the world to make <coughs> progressive changes, rather than saying we need to get rid of the nation state and try and produce something which is international. I mean, international involves n nations, doesn't it, Stu? I don't know if I've answered your question there. Someone, uh, any of you over there? You said you wanted your exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, I just want to say thank you. I, th I think that it was really refreshing to hear your explanation of the difficulties with the working class, and it's something that I've certainly um, observe myself working in social services in Blackburn before I moved here to Liverpool. Um, I think that as well, it was good to hear the, the sort of hopefulness and the viability of some of your solutions. The difficulty I've got is that I think that, at least here in the UK, it seems the only viable um, body or party to, to really be delivering that seems to be the Labour Party. Um, and none other party really can, can compete really within the, the, the political system here. But a really good job has been done discrediting labor in terms of its economic ability. So what I'd like to know is well, how you think this can actually be brought about. How do we go about reversing that sort of picture of the Labour Party? How do we go about engaging and, and, and shedding that sort of middle class image within the Labour Party and reconnecting with the traditional working class? How is that going to work in practice? Well, it's a huge and different, difficult problem. Um, I'm not a great fan of Syriza, but what they did uh, in the build-up of their election is uh, actively attempt to get involved in the lives of people who were struggling across the country of Greece, to assist them with healthcare issues, to educate the kids at the, you know, where, where they were, in many cases they couldn't get to school or whatever else, uh, and they effectively cop uh, copied Golden Dawn effect uh, by who would walk pensioners uh, to pick their pension up and protect them, provide those informal systems of control. And this suggests to me a movement counter to history, which has taken people, taken political representation from the provinces into the metropolitan centre uh, uh, to try and move back into their life worlds. And this has to be done in a non judgmental uh, and effective way. Building connections, talking to people, 
supporting them during troubled times. This is how you provide the, the bedrock, bedrock upon which you can actually begin to move forward politically. But we also need policies. Policies are crucial. Uh, and you have to pitch them in a way that allows the individual to see their own personal benefits, and their own personal interests advance along with the system. A job guarantee, I think, is crucial to that. Think of all the people, if you said, we will employ all unused labour below 25 grand. Think of all the people who are in call centres, who are working in GD Sports, who are in Amazon uh, you know, super, uh, warehouses and whatever else, that said, sod this, I'm, I, I can take a job guarantee at 25 grand. Immediately. Aren't they? Labour voters? Yeah, that's for me. That's how you build, I, I, I think you build those connections. It's incredibly complicated because the old infrastructure that made political conversations deeply personal and effective simply aren't present. We have to recreate them in a new era. Uh, and I think the only way to do that is to reach out uh, to try and connect with these people, but also to build uh, policies that allow them to see their own interests advance. Hi, I'm Emily from the University of Liverpool. I um, enjoyed your talk, thanks so much. I've got a number of sort of comments and then a question, if that's all right. Um, so you um, talked, it was quite a depressing um, a picture that you painted, um, and you made statements that you know there was no, uh, that there'd been this huge rise of the right, um, and that there was no real sort of leftist response to this, um, uh, particularly amongst the working classes. And, also, um, I, I, you know, I have to say I disagree fundamentally with that. I think there's been a huge surge in left politics, particularly amongst the young. I think the Student Workers Solidarity in the recent US has started to show that's just one example. Um, and also you talked about, um, as you sort of hark back to uh, traditional ways of uh, building sort of uh, left-wing working class solidarity, you mentioned working men's clubs and that nothing will sort of replace those traditional methods. And, um, I would say that I wouldn't want that a return to that. I'm a woman and they were close to me um, and would continue to be so. And I think there's actually been loads of examples of really imaginative ways of building solidarity and organising from below, particularly again amongst young people. Um, so I just I sort of wanted to disagree with you uh, on that. But also, um, I think I would say, I mean, you also then mentioned about how we need to engage in a nuanced analysis of what's happening. Um, and that the working class and, and sort of leftist, I guess, uh, thinkers need to sort of engage in, I think you, you said this was a period of mourning. Um, and surely what we actually need to do is get organising. Um, and there's been lots of evidence of that, actually. Um, I've been involved in an activist in many campaigns that have been involving uh, across class and across ethnicities around anti-prison work, around education, um, and that that is the process by which we engage people actually and potentially radicalise people to the left is, is, is from below, is building movements from below and organising together on particular single issues but across different issues and, and looking at in, in the, some of the stuff that Rich and I are involved in in analysing at the moment the book is, is how we can build solidarity between more single issue movements and look at the things that we've got in common across grassroots movements from below. And, um, and then, so I guess like my question at the end of that is, um, I mean, you've mentioned uh, a couple of sort of policies, um, jobs guarantee and, and the Green New Deal, but um, surely the way to get people to engage with new policies like that is to, is, to, is to build from below, is to communicate with people and build from below, not to sort of have this top-down approach of suggesting to the working classes that they should do this or they should do that. I find that. Bit problematic. So, what exactly would you do? With, you've got these policies and these ideas of what the policy should be, but you're also quite stable about the Labour Party. So, how would you get these out? How would you implement these? Well, I've just said that we need to build a community. We need to re-engage with communities. A top-down approach doesn't work. I think we need to headline and try and forcefully. It's very difficult to get any kind of uh, progressive labour policies a decent airing on the BBC, but we have to work very hard to discuss these things in the forums that are available to us. I don't think there's, uh, you know, you're talking about the socialism of the young. I think that's a really important issue, but uh, to Jesus Christ, the depoliticisation of the young is also an issue. To say that all young people are socialists, 
uh, is a, a gross oversimplification. You know, there's young Tories, for God's sake. You know, there are people, I talk to young kids who are willing to take a good item for the ADL. Uh, it's, a, it's a diverse picture. And hope to, to pitch whole generations as, you know, to be politically affiliated isn't good enough, I don't think. We need a more nuanced approach. I think you're right, there are uh, 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 positive uh, signs, uh, but you know, uh, young people involved in single issue protests and think that's all great. That is honestly, I am absolutely support you, you know, sign me up. But the broader picture, especially in electoral statistics, is not looking good for the political left. You know, aside from the 70 and a half million people who voted for Brexit, Look at the number of people who are voting for uh, altern alternatives to Germany. To Germany, you know the, the right are as resurgent across the continent, and it's this idea, you know, this common idea that I, I, I constantly interact with, that you know, with one more push, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. We've been nearly there for 40 years. You know, we're nearly there. You know, we'll, you know, we'll go on a march and whatever else. The true test of activism is what changes the next day. To simply, you know, wave a flag and say, you know, I'm against shit. I'm against all this bad stuff. I'm against that bad stuff. We have to, I, first of all, identify what we're for and what we're fighting for. But the true test of an activist movement is what changes the day after. It can't just be a cathartic. I'm angry about the injustices. There has to be a sense of, well, it did this thing. And that's why we need not kind of bespoke activist movements, but a general movement, a political movement which re-engages, draws diverse people into its orbit and but politicizes them. But activist movements, and, and whether they be seeing this year or more than the place, are achieving things. And, and there are changes that happen that next day. I mean, to suggest that, that, that these movements are, are flag-waving and, and, and angry people marching is, 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 is simply not true. I mean, there are, you know, there are numerous, I mean, I've been involved in a number of them myself. I mean, a prison wasn't built in Hindley because of it, because working class people were engaged in fighting against the building of mega prisons. There's a school in North Wales that's still open because working class people engaged in fighting against, you know, the attempt to shut that down. I mean, I, that, so that, that's happening across the country and across England. I agree. Those things are very good, and I want to support those things. But bespoke critique must be married to a structural critique. If you're an activist, one of the things, uh, people involved in activist movements, you know, you fix a problem and then there's another one. E always a problem arises with each new day. The, the horrors of the world are stacking up on top of each other. I want to over it, but Jesus Christ, there are th hundreds of thousands of people that depend on food banks every week. And they declare a victory. It, it's just, a small victory in what must be a broader campaign of fundamental structural change. Otherwise, we're just putting fingers in dance. Well, of course, but, but declaring victories and successes is crucial to building solidarity, surely. We go around saying everything's complete shit all the time, which, you know, things are shit a lot of the time, but sometimes they're not, actually. Sometimes they're pretty good. And sometimes we can make a difference by building allegiances, alliances, and building solidarity in movements and campaigns by organising with with people, with working class people, or and middle class people, and black and white, and that, that's really important. And to, and to value those things when you know as victories is is crucial. Otherwise, we just, as you say, engage in mourning. And I absolutely no. The mourning thing is a Freudian <coughs> distinction between melancholia and mourning. Mourning is a productive thing. It's not all oh, miserable. It's we can have you come to terms with what has happened, and then you can move away from the horror. Mourning is the best option. If, so I'm, I'm pitching it in terms of work, changes in working class culture. All those traditional cultures are gone. You engage in mourning, you feel a sense of loss, but you move forward. The mourning isn't a kind of misery, let's feel sorry for ourselves. It's a drive towards progress. progress. We accept that that world is gone. The old world of the factory is gone. The old world of traditional working class is gone. This is a new reality, but to accept that, you have to engage in the process of mourning. So it's just a distinction. Now, we can, the right wing remain melancholic. So the people who are involved in the ADL 
they're mourning, that they're, they're, they're disappointed, they're sad about the loss of their community, but they can't give it up. I want to go back to this. I want to live like the, the, the community I grew up in. I want a neighbourhood like I used to live in. They can't give it up. They can't say that it's gone. And that's a problem. Because if we can see that it's gone, we can build new solidarities, which we need to make progress on any stage. So, um, another question up here from John. Uh, thank you. Tough crowd. <laughs> I've heard the back the chest but bear with me. Um, I really enjoyed the talk. I'm really agreeing on a lot of things. In the spirit of solidarity, there's some things that I think that are quite problematic. Um, I think that's the first thing to say that um, I, I agree. I think everyone's kind of agreeing now that the left has, in many cases, failed to articulate a coherent explanation for what's going on. In the, or it has articulated that explanation, but it's not been listened to, it's not been acted upon. Having said that, that doesn't mean that any one person who recognises it, their particular solution to the, the problems is necessarily correct. So I agree with you on that, but I think the submission of the, um, I should say also, you know, I live by identity politics. I live on a council estate where I've lived for decades, still live there. Um, I don't know anyone in the EDL, but it's just perfect with ordinary people, so I would find this a little bit problematic. The, uh, um, just like creating this imaginary of estates where people are, you know, it's the thing kind of created. That's not my lived experience. Um, other points, I mean, I'm quite interested in this idea, you know, Marx said capitalists, their first line of dealing with the crisis is to print money. So Marx knew that they did that, and then very interestingly, that's your solution to the crisis. We're gonna, we're gonna print money, and I can't think of a more neoliberal idea than the idea that, um, that the pound is a fiat currency, that's what Marie Rothbard argued. Um, you can't just print money into existence. You know, why? A, a, why? Actual labour is the foundation of, you know, of, of social, not wealth, but social products. So what you would do you to them with people to work is create, turn their labour into um, a currency that we then use. Anyway. That being by the by, I think most interestingly, most problematically, you know, this this constant dichotomy between the the, uh, the working class and uh, middle class, particularly as cultural categories. When you talk about return to political economy, but then you confuse constantly cultural and economic categories. Uh, Frederick Jameson talks about this. Middle class is well, you can raise your eyebrows. Middle class is a, uh, a very cultural idea, and your idea of the working class is very cultural. And then you merge that with the idea of the proletariat, which is an economic category. Well, Frederick Davidson talks about this is a diversion in itself. Um, but I think also, most importantly, something uh, my colleague Dr. Woods have written on recently, you know, actually these ideas, these old right ideas, if you want to call them that, um, these are very middle class. These are, you know, the kind of growing misogyny, the, the racism, the Islamophobia. You've got a series of very high profile middle class people, people like Richard Dawkins, you know, believers in neo-eugenics, believers in some kind of Volk, um, cultural Christianity, all the foundation elements of fascism, being promoted in the mainstream by highly influential middle class, highly educated people, professors, and people with really, really good jobs. And I think that also needs to be drawn out. This is not some pathology that spreads through the internet to Ignorant working class people. It, it, is that what I was suggesting? No, I, I'm, no, I'm just raising the issue when you're saying, like, you know, we're going to reject this hypodermic idea and it's too simplistic to say that the Daily Mail just does it. Well, actually, those people are really, really influential um, and their ideas, like someone like Richard Dawkins, his ideas, he's a neo eugenicist, his status as a scientist, as an evolutionary theorist. How many people have heard of Richard massively, Dawkins? Uh, on your probably opinion. everyone's heard of Richard Bach, he's quite ridiculous. Um, John, can we get to his the ideas point of the response? Scientized and justified those ideas. So that actually is really, really important. It's not just people like me on the States, it is actually those highly educated middle class people who promote those ideas. You, you need to recognise that. Well, just to, just to say that you're entirely wrong, what I was what I, I hope you would have should have been able to identify is I was presenting the working class as an economic category, which is separate from culture entirely. I'm trying to promote not identitarian white working class, Asian working class, black working class, but to suggest that we need to return to a model 
which is economic, which dissolves those cultural barriers, economic category of being working class, obviously. To suggest that the, fiat, the idea of a fiat currency is neoliberal, it's just, it's neoliberal as a neutral ourselves. category. What? We wrote about that ourselves, so why, how, how, how can that Because that guy said it, it's not true. Well, well, a a stock clock's right that twice a year. identifies as a neoliberal explicitly, so. Yeah, so he must be wrong about everything. How do, how, do, how do you get your money? Where does the money come from? The state prints it into existence, for Christ's sake. Well, I can't think of a more un-Marxist argument, so I'll just let this pop more, so, more un Marxist argument. Well, up here then, right. There's another question at the uh, far side. Try to keep the questions to question-ish, uh, just because I'm conscious of time. That's not to say there's not some really nice interesting debates going on, but just to try and make sure to get as much as possible. Um, hi, I just want to say I really enjoyed that um, and the very interesting on the social policy on the first year and it was all really new and really interesting. But um, I agree with everything you said. My only question is, um, it's not about difference, it's about sameness, but there's not a lot of sameness in the Labour Party. There's a lot of anti corbyn and there's a lot of fighting and we need, don't we need to tackle that? at first to, to get what you're saying across. Absolutely, yeah, and a very strategic thing as a first step is to deselect MPs, the Blairite -Pri Parliamentary Labour Party, who have, you know, systematically tried to ensure that the Tory government stay in power thus far. I don't know how you do it. I think there has to be a kind of a, a democratic audit so that local local Labour parties can deselect MPs that, you know, that they disagree with. I think that's a first step forward. But absolutely, that kind of factionalism. I mean, they, people are in the heart of the Labour Party who are arguing aggressively for the continuation of neoliberal capitalism on its current model. They were fighting against all the uh, kind of grand pr uh, promises that Corbyn made at the last election about nationalising industry. So yeah, that's the first step. We have to draw that, draw that stuff out. And uh, I don't think those people should be part of any leftists. They should join the Tories, most of them. Sorry, what do you do? Yeah, it's just a question about leadership and leaders and how important do you think they are, uh, especially with the rise of the far right and also the left, because you know, uh, arguably. Farage, leader of UKIP, how important was he in attracting um, uh, voters? You had Tommy Robinson, ex leader of EDL, now in UKIP, how important do you think he was? Um, and also, of the counter that, how important do you think you know, Corbyn has been mentioned an awful lot? Um, and do you think he needs to change leadership wise to tackle that? Because you, know, you talked about bashing Blair, arguably he was. He, leadership wise, he's um, uh, the last electable leader of the Labour Party, one of the longest serving leaders uh, as PM. So I just, I, you didn't talk about leadership, I just thought, do you think leadership as a whole is important for both uh, the rise of the right and the left? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very important issue. I think Farage is a really interesting case. Farage played a blinder, I thought. Uh, He's quite articulate, he responds to questions in an unscripted way. That made a lot of headway uh, politically. I think he attracted people with his whole uh, beer and a fag gig. Uh, you know, he, he uh, challenged the conventions of Westminster. And just because of those things, people listened. That's what you need. You need to get people to turn and listen, to pay attention. Because once they're paying attention, you can draw them in a little bit. I don't think uh, we need to replace Corbyn. I think Corbyn's doing a great job. He seems to me, although uh, lots of uh, the, the uh, empirical evidence that I've gathered, those working class people have drifted to the right. They saw Corbyn as a kind of weak chin pacifist, you know, apologist for uh, terrorism and whatever else. They bought into all that. Uh, but I think Corbyn, for a lot of people, stands in front of us as a kind of a, a man of genuine integrity. That, you know, he. he, he he doesn't backtrack, he's not trying to make short-term political gains, he has principles. And I think that does count for a lot, especially if he got more positive airtime, which uh, s seems impossible at the moment. 
But yes, I think we, I think a lot, the postmodern left argued for, the anarchists continue to arg argue for kind of flat structures. That it, uh, democracy is the power, we don't need leaders. Leaders are always authoritarian, they're always self-interested, we need to get rid of leaders. No, I think leaders are important. Leaders can, leaders can convince people. I think articulate leaders, I think Corbyn's fine, but articulate leaders can really assist us in this project. It, uh, I understand that, it's all well and good being fine, but is it electable? Because the only way he's going to do this is if he's elected. And I just don't think he is. Uh, and it even goes down to small things like his appearance, the way he speaks, go back to Blair, other leaders of the government, the way they appeared, it might sound silly, but it was, it, it, it was, it was how it was it how it should be in tick boxes, you know, married, children, suits. And I just don't, I, I just don't, I just don't think he's elected. I think uh, that was a historical moment that is now past. I don't think people want the kind of identity uh, kits parliamentarian with a nice straight tie, they want someone they can uh, kind of uh, 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 you know, connect to, to see themselves and his mannerisms or whatever else. What I'd really like is uh, a, a male or female uh, leader of the Labour Party from a working class background who talked about experience, who talked about their own personal journey. There are some in the Labour Party, I think Laura Piddick's good. Uh, so there are people, there is talent there, uh, but uh, we certainly don't need Blair back, he's toxic. We're in, we're, in a, we're in a building where it's lines on, on the wall. And it's all a bit, I don't know. It's, I, don't know. I, think, I, think that, I think it's almost come, like, it, it's, it's cool now to point fingers at Blair. And well, he did say it was into an illegal war that states, killed me. pointed fingers at that, but, you know, 20 years before all that, is that where the fingers should still be pointed? There's a question over here. I was yeah, just going to say that in 2003, I was one of two million people who was marching against Tony Blair in that year. So, um, and who, who was it? Who was your last question? Oh, what was it? What was that? Okay. Um, so I just want to slightly come back on that point up there as well about electability. Um, I, mean, I think it's hard to make that argument when um, we've seen the best Labour vote in, in 20 odd years um, at the 2017 election. And I think if you, and this kind of feeds into a, a reflection I'd like to make if that's okay on, on the talk. Um, and you know, I think one way of seeing that election last year was that actually Corbyn um, standing on a much more, and I'm, I'm not saying this as a Labour Party member, I would add, but Corbyn, but a socialist who supports a redistributionist program. And um, Corbyn represented that kind of orientation. And therefore, um, you know, there was a, a distinct and sharp rise in, in support for Labour on the basis of a policy agenda and a kind of rejection of this kind of shallow politics of spin doctrine and triangulation and so on. So I think that's a very, very welcome um, shift. It shows the terrain of struggle that we need to be on. It's not the terrain of, you know, triangulation electri electoral, um, you know, that, that, that politics has gone. That was 20 years ago insofar as it, and in a sense, that's the problem. Because, I mean, I think what you're saying in terms of the shift from social democratic, um, you know, electorally, a shift in support from social democratic parties to the far right should be, um, uh, should be more specific uh, in terms of identifying those social democratic politicians and programmes as what Terry Kelly has described as the extreme centre. So an abandonment of a kind of uh, meeting the interests of the vast majority of ordinary working class people and to a kind of, you know, third way neoliberalism. You know, we saw that in this SPD in Germany, New Labour, et cetera, et cetera, Socialist Party in France. And um, I think we see, what we're seeing at the moment is a polarisation politically to the left and to the right. But I think that, um, you know, I wasn't, I must admit, I wasn't totally clear on, um, you know, so the policy proposals there, I mean, actually agree with you on the Green New Deal and so on, but 
I, I couldn't see the mechanism for how that those ideas, things that I support, things like Green New Deal, I couldn't see what your kind of mechanism was for for achieving that. Um, but what I what I've seen in my own experience is that, for instance. Um, I've been doing some work alongside colleagues in the Labour Party in Liverpool around universal credit at the moment. Grassroots mobilisation, so it's not, it's not a top-down mobilisation, it's a grassroots mobilisation. Uh, very sensitive to making sure that, that you know, the campaign is oriented around people who are most affected by that, but also looking to build alliances and solidarities across the trade union movement, in, in communities and so on. And to me, it's that kind of grassroots rooted politics in communities but with a class orientation that is going to be the way that we move forward for this and policy programs will emerge out of that and even though i'm not a labor party member i think one of the things that corbyn has been talking about is democratization and that's that's what we need to be doing here that you know looking at building campaigns where people get a sense of reconnecting with that democratic um potential so i guess that's more of a comment than a question but i just i wondered if it, what were your pr proposals on political strategy, if you like? How do we realise, you know, what are the mechanisms for organising on the ground to, to realise that, those proposals? Well, I think the, the first step, uh, if I address the, address the macro uh, policy area first, is to identify policies that people can attach themselves to and see, their, or see gains for themselves in those policies. So the first and foremost, I think, for a Labour Party should be jobs guarantee. I think we need to fundamentally change the way that we approach uh, economic management. I think uh, we uh, remain attached, fetishistically attached, to uh, a deficit management, this absurd idea that we need taxes to pay for stuff. If that's not, that's an old idea. We need to move beyond that and try and convince people that we can always afford any policy suggestions that we're building in the political realm we can do that by managing our economy effectively. In terms of how do we communicate those things, I think we need we do need articulate people to stand in front of the TV camera and talk at people and say you can benefit, here's the policy. But that has to be connected to a, an attempt, attempts to re-engage depoliticised populations and draw them back onto the field of politics and say you can all benefit here, this is your project. This is, this, this is everyone gains here. You can gain by the nationalisation of rail. You can gain by the nationalisation of uh, energy. You can gain by, uh, you know, drop the sign up to a job guarantee program. These things are practical, but also just to connect the people, to listen to them, and uh, you know, to move beyond that kind of, uh, you know, the division that has opened up between a kind of su suggestion about kind of metropolitan policy elite and everyday people who are out li living in the real world. That gap has to be cl cl uh, closed if the Labour Party is going to be successful. Yeah, You've got 30 seconds, Richard, then we're going to have yeah. to tie off. I, I guess my question was, like, you know, so I was out on Bolton Street in Liverpool, giving out leaflets, speaking to people, you know, in the centre of town, was that about universal credit, what we do, we're organising meetings, we're going to demonstrate, we're trying to build, generalise, thinking about how we link that to neoliberalism, having those political debates and building networks and then you know building our local kind of groups within community so that's a concrete strategy of organizing you know working with the trade union movement and bring it into workplace scenes if we can link workers struggle with those grassroots community struggles to me that's the we're starting from um, um, you know I, I can't see what you're suggesting it to me sounds very top down it's about you know how we like how we present these arguments in the media i'm not saying that these aren't relevant, but what I'm saying is if we're going to create change, then I think we have to build build up, if you like, um, and cross horizontally rather than that, that kind of um, top-down approach. So I, I'm not sure, I still can't get a sense of what your actual strategy for organising is. Well, I'm suggesting a dual track. I said the policy, the macro level policy stuff, but I also said we have to get involved with people. So that kind of activism is great, good. But we also have to engage, you know, when people say you're talking about universal credit and they're in a major support, you have to say what you're saying, that's important. We also have to chase after the people that say they bring it on themselves, they're profligate, wasteful, da 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 da. You have to chase after those people and try and convince them too. This is how you build, you know, you try and draw them in. Well, what if you lost your job? But you never had a family member struggle? What if you, you know, got permanent sick? What if, what if 
pose questions, draw them in, engage them. You know, rather than just focusing upon those people who are, you know, preaching to the choir, people who are already attached, at least, uh, you know, pragmatically to Methodist politics. But it's a dual track. I'm not suggesting top down. I'm suggesting dual track. And as if by magic, we've arrived at one minute to seven, um, which means that we've pretty much perfectly timed on that one. So first things first, I'd like to thank uh, Simon for joining us tonight, uh, coming across and sharing his thoughts. Uh, but more importantly, also perhaps uh, to everybody for coming along uh, and taking part. Those that uh, had various questions um, and helped to inform the debate, those that were simply here to absorb the debate and think about and reflect on how things are progressing. Um, I quite like the fact that various bits of disagreement at various points, all, everyone, broadly speaking, arguing towards the same end goal, um, just from a range of different positions. Um, and academic debate is always healthy. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, Michael, when's the next one? Do you know? Uh, good question. Uh, four, week, four weeks from now. I can't uh, Keep an eye out and talk to anybody in the <laughs> anybody in the department. They'll be able to give you more information about the next talk um, in four weeks' time. Um, thank you very much.